Coming up, are you eating yourself into an early grave? Three different doctors told me that same thing. Your diet may be putting you at risk for cancer. And it just absolutely amazes me that medical science is just now finding this out. The good news, you can win the fight. We think it's important to get this information out. Plus, celebrating the anniversary of the event that changed the world, Lou Engel carries on the legacy of Azusa Street on today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. It took place in New Hampshire, then it went to South Carolina, and last night it was Nevada. Another huge victory for the Donald. Uh, and once again, the real fight was for second place between Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Now the Republicans are turning their attention toward the huge Super Tuesday primaries in the South next week while Trump will be looking to add to his lead. Caitlin Burke has the story. Donald Trump is on a winning streak. Today, celebrating a massive win in Nevada, keeping the strong momentum for his campaign. We love Nevada, we love Nevada. The easy victory coming from a combination of love for Trump and anger at the Republican establishment and the White House. Of course, if you listen to the pundits, we weren't expected to win too much, and now we're winning, winning, winning the country. The win in the Silver State sets Trump far ahead of his opponents. He claimed nearly 46 percent of the vote. His closest challengers, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, continue to battle for second, Rubio with around 24 percent of the vote, and Cruz a little over 21 percent. An important factor in Trump's win? According to CNN, entrance polls showed he was winning among Latino GOP caucus goers. That's even with his campaign's hard line on immigration. The Republican candidates are now turning their attention to Super Tuesday on March 1st, when more than a dozen mostly southern states from Texas to Virginia could give some of the leading candidates a big boost. On the other side, the Democrats are focused on South Carolina, which holds its Democratic primary on Saturday. At a CNN town hall in the Palmetto State Tuesday night, the candidates focused on African Americans who make up half of the state's electorate. We must sustain and strengthen the historically black colleges and universities. Racism, along with economic issues, educational issues and all the rest, have to be addressed. Today, Clinton is campaigning in South Carolina while Sanders heads to Missouri. The Republicans take part in a voter summit hosted by Megyn Kelly of Fox News. An anchor Trump has had some rough relations with in this campaign season. He declined the event and will instead be appearing at the Regent University Presidential Candidate Forum. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, I'm looking forward to just a few hours. I'll be talking to the Donald and then that'll be uh, aired tomorrow on the 700 Club. <laughs> And uh, you can watch the streaming on that, by the way, on uh, starting at noon Eastern time. And as I say, we'll have highlights uh, on tomorrow's 700 Club. It is simply amazing. You know, that's the one thing we've got in common. I, I won the Nevada caucuses in '88. Did you really? Yeah, oh, and uh, yeah, I had a I had a delegation from. Um, one of my delegates was a pit boss, another one was a cocktail waitress. I mean, I had a, uh, I won Vegas going big. So you won, you won Iowa pretty handedly. Yeah, I won, well, I was second in Iowa, but it looked like a win, and, and I beat Bush. And uh, Nevada and Hawaii, some of these, and Alaska, I, I won those caucuses. It was fun. Uh, but uh, nothing like the Donald. I've never seen anything like it. I we, just can't. What's so interesting, Pat, is I mean, you've been there. You were mm. in the trenches. You That's ran right. for president. You understand what these guys are going through. Uh, completely. Which but, makes uh, you a perfect interviewer for Donald uh, Trump oh, today. Oh, yeah. I, 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 as they say, I feel your pain. I know what it's <laughs> like, but I've never seen anything like him. I, I've just uh, never, never. Maybe he'll tell us uh, today. I'm looking forward to learning what the secret sauce is. Well, in other news, the Republicans in the Senate are making it clear they will not vote on anyone President Obama nominates for the Supreme Court. Ephraim Graham has the story. 
Pat Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the Senate will revisit the issue of a new Supreme Court justice after the presidential election. Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee say anyone President Obama nominates will not get a hearing. They point to a video of Vice President Joe Biden back when he led the committee in 1992. In that speech, Biden said the Senate should not consider holding hearings until after the election. Republicans say they agree with Biden, saying any nomination during a presidential election will be flooded with political agendas. It's up to the American people in this next election, no matter who they choose, to make the nomination for this important seat on the Supreme Court. Justice Scalia served for 30 years, so this clearly extends far beyond President Obama's term of office. It's that important. Senator John Cornyn said the nominee to replace the late Justice Antonin Scalia will be decided by voters in the November election, not a lame duck president. Pre president. Pat? Well, I, I, I just salute Mitch McConnell. He's getting to be a tough leader, and that's what the American people want. At least the Republicans want. They want, a, they want tough guys uh, representing them and standing up for their values, and he's decided he's going to get tough on this one. But let's face it. Uh, Joe Biden, he was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He set the tone. He says, we will not consider nominees during a lame duck session. And he's right. I mean, it's a political thing. I mean, we politicize the whole matter, uh, go back and forth. And the American people need to speak uh, in a deliberative way uh, after the election. Then their, their uh, choice of president can make the uh, appropriate uh, selection because they're not going to be one. There will probably be three uh, for the next president. Ephraim? Pat, after seven years in office, President Obama is trying to make good on his campaign promise from 2008 to close the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. He says it puts America at risk, but critics say it serves as a tool to gather intelligence. And both Republicans and Democrats have opposed the idea of closing Gitmo. Jennifer Wishon brings us the story now from Washington. Shots of terrorists wearing trademark orange Gitmo jumpsuits are a staple in recruitment videos for jihadists, according to senior White House officials. So they argue closing the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center will dry up propaganda that's putting America at risk. With one year left in office, President Obama released his long-awaited plan to close the detention center, and he got mixed reviews. This is about closing a chapter in our history. Of the 91 detainees at Guantanamo, 35 will soon be transferred to other countries. 10 are moving through the military commission process. The president wants to accelerate periodic reviews of those remaining to determine if they continue to pose a threat to the U.S. After that, the White House estimates 30 to 60 detainees will be left, and the president wants those transferred to somewhere in the U.S. His national security team identified 13 possible facilities, including existing federal prisons and military bases, but didn't make any specific recommendations. I think a lot of the American public are worried about terrorism, and in their mind, the notion of having terrorists held in the United States rather than in some distant place can be scary. But he argues American courts have successfully handled high-profile terrorism cases, while American prisons are already housing dangerous terrorists. Terrorists like Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, who tried to blow up an airplane over Detroit, and Zohar Zaniev, who bombed the Boston Marathon. They were all convicted in our Article III courts and are now behind bars here in the United States. Congress has blocked the president from moving any detainees into the U.S. And while there is some bipartisan support for the idea, moving Gitmo terrorists into America's backyard during an election year is a very hard sell. Republican presidential candidates blasted the president's plan. Florida Senator Marco Rubio tapped into the concern that many Americans have that under the president's proposal, terrorists captured in the future will lawyer up immediately before they can be interrogated. When I'm president, if we capture a terrorist alive, they're not getting a court hearing in Manhattan. They're not going to be sent to Nevada. They're going to Guantanamo. And we're going to find out everything they know. Republican Senator John McCain has long supported closing Gitmo. He chairs the Senate committee that will consider the president's plan, but he's not impressed. 
What we receive today is a vague menu of options, not a credible plan for closing Guantanamo, let alone a coherent policy to deal with future terrorist detainees, McCain says. And critics point out that the president's announcement came just as a former Gitmo detainee was reportedly arrested in Spain for recruiting for ISIS. The president is also catching criticism from groups like Amnesty International, which complains that instead of closing Guantanamo, he's simply changing its zip code. White House officials say they see the plan as a starting point for discussion. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, Washington. The White House isn't doing enough to fight potential fraud in Obamacare. That is the finding in a new report today from the nonpartisan Government Accountability Office. It finds the Obama administration has taken a passive approach to identifying possible fraud. Investigators say the administration has had a hard time deciding who was really eligible for benefits among the millions of applicants. A leading House Republican says the program could be giving benefits to people who are not eligible to receive them. Just a small amount of weight loss can lead to big health gains for obese people. Losing just 5% of their weight cuts back the risk of heart disease and diabetes. It also improved the functioning of their liver and muscles. Those were among the findings from a small study at Washington University in St. Louis. And experts say it's proof. Even dropping what may seem like a small amount of weight, just 5%, can pay off. And it can also set people on the road to losing more until they get to a healthy weight. Pat? Well, coming up, uh, could you be putting yourself at risk for cancer one spoonful at a time? And it just absolutely amazes me that medical science is just now finding this out. Find out what the culprit is, and you'll be stunned when you find out how much you're eating of it. That's next. Well, as if it's not scary enough living in the world we are, scientists are now saying we may be killing ourselves. Two thirds of all the cancers are caused by our own bad choices like smoking or not exercising, and the granddaddy of them all, a poor diet, because what you eat can literally kill you. Our CBN News health reporter, Laurie Johnson, tells us about the dramatic link between cancer and sugar. A clear relationship between sugar and cancer leads scientists to two conclusions. Sugar use contributes to cancer, and going without it can slow growth of the disease. A hundred years ago, most folks consumed only four pounds of sugar a year. That's this much. Now, however, the average person takes in 40 times this amount, 160 pounds of sugar a year. That's this much. Food manufacturers add enormous amounts of sugar, usually in the form of high fructose corn syrup, to products we consume all day, every day. Coffee drinks and cereal, soda and snacks, even foods you wouldn't expect like spaghetti sauce and peanut butter. This tiny container of yogurt contains more sugar than a candy bar. Now, scientists tell us sugar directly influences cancer cells. The amount we consume can either feed those cells or starve them. In a landmark study, researchers at UTMD Anderson Cancer Center fed mice high fructose corn syrup in percentages equal to what many humans consume. Those mice developed higher rates of lung and breast cancer compared to mice fed less sugar. The study also tells us something about people who already have cancer. One researcher said a lot of patients are told it doesn't matter what you eat after you are diagnosed with cancer. This preliminary animal research suggests that it does matter. And it just absolutely amazes me that medical science is just now finding this out. Fred Hatfield knows firsthand sugar intake matters after a cancer diagnosis. Back in 2012, his diagnosis was basically a death sentence. The doctors gave me three months to live. 
because of widespread metastatic cancer in my skeletal structure. Three months. Three different doctors told me that same thing. It's a horrible, horrible feeling to have someone tell you that the person that you love only has three months to live and you're not going to be with him anymore. Then Fred heard about a low sugar diet called the ketogenic diet, believed to slow cancer in some people. With nothing to lose, he gave it a try, and to his astonishment, it worked. And the cancer was gone, completely. Fred's recovery didn't surprise Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. His team at the University of South Florida discovered mice with highly aggressive metastatic cancer continued living when fed a ketogenic diet. We have uh, dramatically increased survival uh, with metabolic therapy. So we think it's important to get this information out. And it's not just lab animals. Dr. D'Agostino has seen similar results in humans. I've been in uh, correspondence with a number of people, probably at least a dozen people. And uh, over the last year and a half to two years, and uh, all of them are still alive, <laughs> so despite the odds. And uh, so this is very encouraging. The ketogenic diet means no sugar and no starchy carbohydrates like bread and pasta that convert to sugar. D'Agostino says cancer cells love sugar and starch because cancer thrives on the glucose from those foods. Remove the glucose and starve the cancer cells. Glucose also fuels our healthy cells, but if it's not there, those cells can switch to an alternate fuel source called ketone bodies. Cancer cells only run on glucose. Your normal cells have the metabolic flexibility to adapt from using glucose to using ketone bodies, but cancer cells lack this metabolic flexibility, so we can exploit that. Since processed food contains so much sugar and starch, People following the ketogenic diet tend to cook whole foods from scratch. You can go online and there's just cookbooks and, you know, it's not, it's, it's clean eating, just very clean eating. None of the sugars, the salts, the, you know, the, um, the trash food. So when it comes to cancer, sugar is considered public enemy number one. Avoiding it could lead to prevention or slow it down in people fighting the disease. Laurie Johnson is here with us. Laurie, is this groundbreaking studies that they're doing? It really is. We already knew that sugar was directly linked to diabetes, which right. causes amputations and death. We already knew that sugar was linked to heart disease, which is the number one killer. Now we know for sure that sugar is linked to cancer. The right. average person consumes 22 teaspoons of sugar a well, day. Now, yeah. That's this many down here on the very end, 22 teaspoons. Now, according to the American Heart Association, and what we should be consuming a day is only 60 teaspoons a day. That's that right, much. Well, now, I, 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 most people don't take that many lumps of sugar and put it in their coffee. I mean, where does the sugar come from? Comes from, well, take a look. Right, Beverages a look. Okay. are a real big problem. This little Coke right here, yeah. that has 10 teaspoons of sugar. That's more than one day's allowance. Okay. Right next to it, people think these sports drinks are mm. great. Oh, I'll run around the block and drink a Gatorade. You got t you've got nine teaspoons in that one bottle of you Gatorade. You have more in that, or as many as it is in a Coke. Absolutely, just healthy. about the same. Right, and then now, what's then next these to it? Energy it, drinks, it, which are so popular. Bull? This is not Red Bull. This particular one is Rockstar, but so many of them contain this particular one right there. Sixteen teaspoons of sugar in that one energy drink, and look over here at the coffee. That has 20 teaspoons of sugar in it. I got that from Starbucks. That's the Venti White Chocolate Mocha. It's yeah. delicious, but look at all the sugar. Three days worth. How much you have to pay for that? Uh, Five dollars. Uh, to get cancer, you got to lay out $5? <laughs> I know. It oh. kills you, and, and you spend a lot for it to boot. That, that one cup of coffee has got more sugar than a Coke or energy drink. Look at that pile of sugar. How, much, how many teaspoons? Of sugar is in that? In in the in coffee, the coffee is 20. Yeah. 20. And 20. we're supposed to only have six teaspoons a day. Uh, that would be like second. How can you eat anything that sweet? It would be over it'd be sickening, wouldn't it? Well, you know what the research shows that? is that when we get our sugar from drinks, that it disables the mechanism in our brain that says, I'm full. 
Oh. So you don't, it does it, you don't recognize the fact that you're full and you keep drinking more and more of them. So yeah, um, there, some people are saying, how can I get all this sugar out of my diet? Yeah, right. And one of the best ways to do it, That's there are it. a lot of different ways, but one of the best ways is to, instead of drinking these sweetened beverages, to just drink water, water. Okay. and also you can cut back on the sugar that you add to your coffee or tea eventually weaning yourself to none drink it black mm -hmm. also stop putting so much syrup on your pancakes and waffles again try to put zero syrup on your pancakes and mm -hmm. waffles and when it comes to baking this is a little secret okay. just only put in half the amount of sugar that the recipe calls for or even less and you can replace that sugar with things like extracts or spices like cinnamon and if you have to have oatmeal cereal or yogurt buy the plain unsweetened kind and sweeten it mm -hmm. with fruit speaking of fruit oh, yeah. um, try to always eat fresh or frozen don't get the canned kind in nice. the heavy yeah. syrup right. because that's just sugar my goodness gracious but it's in cereals it's in bread it's in almost everything and especially for what we give to little children we create a craving in them for sweet stuff. It is addictive, and a lot of people are confused when they go to the grocery store. How do I know if a certain product has sugar in it? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always called sugar on the label. There are other names for sugar. We already talked about the high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. but also other foods ending well, in ose, like dextrose, sucrose, maltose, anything ending in ose, that's sugar. Look on the label. If you see the word syrup, that's sugar, corn sweetener, malt sugar, molasses, even honey. And another way you can recognize how much sugar is in a product is mm. look at the label. See the one right here. Yeah. If you look at the list of ingredients, the manufacturers are required by law to put in order how much of something is in the product. So they always start out with whatever the product contains the most of. Look right there, sugar is the number two ingredient. So if sugar is one of the first two or three ingredients, that means it has a lot. Also look up above at the nutrition facts where it says added sugars. It'll say it in grams. Mm. Just divide that by four because there are four grams of sugar to every teaspoon. So that particular instance had 20 grams. Life, there you see 20 uh, grams of sugar. That means four and a half teaspoons. What do you watch on television? You watch Fruit Loops. You watch, uh, have, you know, uh, whatever those things are that people eat. Uh, honey uh, buckets of oats and all that. <laughs> honey they buckets could, of sugar. Of sugar. <laughs> That's what it should be called. But, I mean, and you know, little children are, are watch those cartoons, and then they get to the grocery store, and they're riding along in that basket with mommy, and they say, "Mommy, I want that." And so mommy gives it to them because she doesn't know any better. I know it's so true, and people have got to stop getting their nutrition information from television mm -hmm. and the labels, the front labels of the packages, because people say, well, this has got to be good. It says so right here on the label. It's healthy. Well, uh, little kids, there's an epidemic of obesity among the young. I mean, before people are 10 years old, they're fat and they can't move around and they just kind of sit and watch television. It's disgusting. Right. And but, you know, really over the last 50 mm. years is when we started adding all this sugar, yeah. the high fructose corn syrup, especially to all the foods that we eat. So paleo, they're supposed to eat meat uh, and eggs and fresh vegetables mm -hmm. and fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. And that's nuts. A, I know you're a big nut I, fan. I do. I mean, I get a great big thing of mixed nuts, and and that's what I mean. For example, I had a little bit of uh, uh, bran cereal with frozen blueberries, a mm -hmm. lot of them, with some mixed nuts. That was breakfast. You get a gold star, and I know you're yeah! a big. Tea, I know you're a big tea drinker too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really healthy. Also, if if uh, I had to say one thing to just oversimplify the whole nutrition thing. No processed foods. Okay. Well, folks, it's you go on the outside of the uh, uh, aisle when you're going around the the the, um, the perimeter, the, the perimeter of the grocery store, and look at those things. You've got to work. You have to work to make that. I I I, I, I cook my famous minestrone, and I'm telling you, I had to work. I had to chop onions and chop celery and chop this and chop right. the other. But when it's finished, it's really delicious. It is, and you know, back in the day there used to be one person in the family assigned to cooking yeah. and now both people work <laughs> and there's a, nobody to do the cooking so let's just food. get it from the drive-through. Yeah. Anyhow, Lori, are you going to keep us all healthy? And, 
I'm, I'm going to 100. If, if, if I guess that's what I'm supposed to live to, 100. 100 plus. Oh, 100 plus. Whatever. Yeah, I'll keep, take whatever you say. Keep, let's just keep inching that higher. Right, we're going up little by little by little. <laughs> Laurie Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, we're trying to keep you alive and healthy and well. Wendy, what do you have next? All right, great stuff. Well, the woman in our next story tried to change her diet, but that did nothing to stop her extreme acid reflux. It was horrible. It was in my stomach. I just felt bad all over. Watch as she's instantly healed from decades of discomfort. That's next. The worldwide red carpet premiere of the movie Miracles from Heaven, starring Jennifer Garner and Queen Latifah, will be in Los Angeles on March the 9th. And you can win a four-night trip for two to this gala event. Just sign up at CBN.com slash Miracles from Heaven. The contest ends midnight on Thursday. So go to CBN.com slash Miracles from Heaven and sign up for your chance to win. That sounds like fun, Pat. I guess. <laughs> Tinseltown for all of us. Well, Florence Giles would never say, I'm sick. Instead, she'd say, I'm under attack. And since she was in her late 30s, she was constantly under attack from a terrible case of what's known as acid reflux. Here's how Florence won the battle, just by turning on the television said. For almost 20 years, Florence Giles suffered with chronic acid reflux. It was horrible. It was in my throat. It was in my stomach. I just felt bad all over. Florence went to her doctor for help, but the price of prescription medication started to add up, so she tried to control the acid with her diet. I tried to watch what I would eat, so no matter what it was, if it was late or what time it was, it was just there. I couldn't sleep well at night. Then I would put my hand here and just press down. For years, Florence prayed for relief. On July 19, 2013, Florence was watching the 700 Club. Causing fraying of the tendons. I was sitting on the sofa, and Gordon prayed, and then they were almost like ending, and Terry said, Someone else, you have extreme um, acid reflux, and you've had it for a long time. God's healing that. And, oh, I just jumped, and I knew. I knew. I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew, yeah, I'm going to take my acid reflux. I knew you healed me. You healed me. Florence says her acid reflux stopped that very day and has never returned. I love to eat, and I just ate anything. It didn't bother me. So... I just praise God for that, for the healing. Believe, and you will receive what he's done for me. He'll do for you. I believe in miracles, and we're going to pray for a miracle for you. And here's one report that I have in my hand uh, from Taylor, not Tyler, but Taylor, Texas, Yolanda, uh, would get cramps in her intestines every time uh, she ate. She saw a doctor said it was either IBS or diverticulitis. She continued having the problem for several years. She was watching this program. Terry had a word. You do have intestinal problem every time you eat, your abdomen swells. Mm -hmm. Yolanda said, that's me. And she has had no problem since. All right. We've got this one from Anita of Warren, Ohio. She knew something was seriously wrong with her right eye. She was experiencing constant flashes of light. The doctor confirmed her fear that her sight was at risk and that she could be experiencing the start of either her retina tearing or worse, completely detaching. Fearing that she might be faced with surgery to try to restore her sight, Anita immediately called the 700 Club Prayer Center for healing prayers. As time progressed, the flashes stopped one month later. Anita's doctor confirmed that he could not find any problem with her eye and therefore no need for surgery. Praise the Lord. So that's interesting because sometimes it, it happens right away. Yes. This happened a month later. She was completely healed. Folks, uh, there's nothing impossible with God. And uh, we want to join hand. Here's what the Bible says. I want to quote it to you. If two of you would agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. Now, if there's an agreement, now, Wendy and I are going to agree. 
You'll agree? I agree. I agree. All right. <laughs> And we agree that we will pray for you. So we will ask that you agree with us as we pray for you. Yes. So, Father, in Jesus' name, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come into people's lives right now. Somebody else has uh, that irritable bowel syndrome thing, IBS. Mm -hmm. The Lord has just healed you now. You'll feel like fire going to the middle of your intestine, and you are healed in Jesus' name. Wendy. Other people with acid reflux, you saw that story and you're saying, what about me, Lord? I want to be healed. And God is saying, today is your day. Just praise him. Jesus is healing you right now. Uh, you, I believe the name's Mark. But anyhow, you've got a, a, a foot that's cocked off to one side. When you walk, the thing goes off at a, like a 45 degree angle instead of going straight. Right now, your hip's going to be uh, completely realigned. Your knee will be realigned. Your toe will be realigned. And you will be walking straight and running straight in the name of Jesus. You will feel it going right now in Jesus' name. Uh, Wendy. Yeah, someone else with problems in your right eye. And God is um, touching you right now. And just receive it in Jesus' name. Oh, my, you're so sick. You're You've got morning sickness. You, you just discovered you're pregnant and you, you're starting to throw up and you just said, oh, God, help me. You're crying out to him right now. The Lord's heard your prayer. Uh, you're going to have a successful pregnancy and, and that um, nausea is, is going away even as I speak in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's someone else who's praying for yes. a baby Thank and you. uh, you've not been successful Thank yet, you, but God says, hold on. It is coming. It's going to happen. Just receive Amen. it in Jesus' name. Well, Wherever you are, please call us. We'd love to hear from you. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy. Well, still ahead, it's the event that started a movement with a half billion followers. And you can be on hand as it begins its next phase. Lou Engel takes us inside the Azusa Street Revival. That's later on today's show. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The owners of an upstate New York wedding venue fined for refusing to host a lesbian wedding now say they will not pursue an appeal in court. Robert and Cynthia Gifford said hosting the wedding violated their Christian beliefs, but a state appeals court in January rejected the Giffords' argument, ordering a $13,000 fine and re-education classes. The Giffords' attorneys say the couple are now trying to figure out how to run their business, quote, under a legal regime that disregards their convictions. Experts working on a restoration of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem have found an icon of what one Palestinian official says is of great religious and historical value. The icon, which was found two months ago, is made of brass, silver, shells, and stones. Millions of Christians from all over the world visit the church built over the cave or grotto where many believe Jesus was born. It was originally built in the fourth century, but the basilica was in poor condition after centuries of neglect. About three years ago, the Palestinian Authority led an initiative to finance a restoration project that will cost about $20 million. Once a primarily Christian town, Bethlehem is now in a predominantly Muslim city in Palestinian-controlled area. But they still claim the church as part of their national heritage. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Welcome back. Well, picture this. You're in a stadium jam-packed with 100,000 other believers, and you're all there to celebrate one of the biggest events in modern Christian history. Here's the good news. This can be a reality, all courtesy of Lou Engel's latest mega event. Lou Engel has been organizing large prayer rallies since 1999. He is the co-founder of The Call, a prayer movement where hundreds of thousands of people gather for prayer, fasting and worship. On April 9th in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, The Call will hold a prayer rally called Azusa Now. The event will be held on the 110th anniversary of the Azusa Street outpouring, the beginning of the Pentecostal charismatic movement in the U.S. Lou is praying this event will help to start a great awakening in America that will turn people back to God. 
and Lou Ingle is here with us now. Lou, my friend, good to see you. God Wendy, you. it's so good to see you. You were with us 16 years ago when the first call took place, and it's a blessing to On be with you. On the mall in D.C., half a million people. I was, yeah, amazing, amazing. <laughs> I've been following you for a while. So, but anyway, this is Azusa Street event. It's coming up April 9th. Yeah. Um, it's to com commemorate the, the first one that happened 100 years ago. Uh, a lot of folks might not have heard about Azusa Street. What happened there? Well, it, what happened was an African-American man named William Seymour came from Houston. He was seeking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God fell in 1906 in a small group of believers. That tongue of fire erupted on the place called Azusa Street, and it spread all over the world. It was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it was the, they said the color line was washed away in the blood. It united the body of Christ and all those races. Could God do such a thing again? How long did it last, and why did it end? Well, it, it, it actually went to about 2000, uh, I mean, 1916. Okay. And it really, it was partly racial division in the body of Christ that actually ended it. And so, but we believe that God's bringing these things back again because he wants to make us one. So before it ended, though, William Seymour and someone else had a prophecy uh, that's pertinent to today. Tell us about that. It was somewhere between uh, 1909 and 1913. He prophesied that in a hundred years, a revival far eclipsing Azusa Street would take place. Maria Woodworth Eder, the healing revivalist, prophesied the same thing. I've just run into a man in Africa that has 10 million people have been praying that prophecy for three years, thank God. It's time. We believe we're in a season of a great outpouring of the Spirit. Because if I do my math correct, it's 100 years later. Yeah, we're like, in that moment like, right exactly. now. Like Daniel, when he yeah. knew it was time, he set his face to fast and pray to see that prophecy fulfilled. And, okay, this is happening after April 9th. You said you've got about 1,000 people a day signing up to come yeah, to California? It's, it's been extraordinary. They, uh, something's happening. I think there's a sense in the spirit all over the globe, but in America, in the church, there's this expectancy that God is getting ready to move again. And we're excited that this could be a flashpoint. I don't think it's the beginning. I think it's just a flashpoint yeah. of encouraging and releasing power and signs and wonders. Well, you're most known for the call prayer movement. And as you mentioned, I was with you back when it started back in D.C. It was an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Then you moved. Then we had 9-11. You moved up to, to Boston, New York. Uh, there's so many of Nashville, them. Nashville, 777. Nashville. You even had one in Jerusalem in uh, 2008. Yeah. I went to that one. It was incredible. Um, and you've called this a John the Baptist type of movement. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, before it started, I had a dream in which I was overwhelmed with the impossibility of seeing America turn back to God. But in the dream, a scroll rolled down before me, and it said, and he will go on before the Lord and the Spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers, fathers to the children and the rebellious to the wisdom of the righteous. And in the dream, I just knew the Lord was saying that this was a, it's not, it, I'm, it's not a John the Baptist, but it, it had that yeah. fasting, praying, Nazarite kind of deal. We've done that for 16 years, but maybe I could say this, Wendy, it was th four years ago, these YWAMers, Youth with a Mission leader guys, came into my living room and said, there's coming a shift to the call and it will not be just fasting and prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel, signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled and Billy Graham's mantles coming on the nation. It shocked me. For two days we prayed, as we're closing our time, this prophet from Nashville calls my friend who's in the meeting. He says, do you know where Lou Engel is? Tell him I had a visitation last night. Tell him there's coming a shift to the call, and it will not be just fasting and prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled, wow. and Billy Graham's mental. From that point on, I felt like the Lord say, Lou, there's coming a shift from this John the Baptist. We're headed to a Jesus movement because the last word of John was not prepare the way of the Lord. It, it was behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world and he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. I believe we're in a new day. We're headed to a new Jesus movement in America. You know, and I know you get a lot of dreams, a lot of very prophetic dreams and the uh, inspiration for this Azusa Street revival came in a dream, right? It's, it was stunning. I, I had gotten reconciled with the leader of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Azusa Street mi mission, and he said, the, the call of Azusa Street's still waiting for you. And then the Lord spoke to me to look up April 9, 2016, the 110th anniversary. It's a Saturday. I looked it up. It's a Saturday. So I <laughs> called my friend, who's been like a prophet to me for 31 years, and he said, D I had a dream. 
In this dream, I had to buy five sets of five plane tickets. I think it's Grace. And in this dream, we could only fly United Airlines. <laughs> and he knew that the only way the church can fly right now, we must be united. Because yes. only a united church can heal a divided nation. Mm -hmm. He said, I was so concerned I had missed the flight uh, that I looked up the dates of the, of the tickets. And it was in 1,080 days. He woke up out of the dream. He looked up 1,080 days, April 9th. 2016, the 110th anniversary of Azusa Street. I believe yeah. it's time again for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lou, what can happen when this many believers, how many are you, are you expecting in, in, is it Pasadena? Yes, it, it, no, it's in the Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Yes. How many, and what can happen, what can God do when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of believers gather together for, for one day? One shall put a thousand to flight, to 10,000. <laughs> what happens if 100,000 or 70,000 gather together? We're going to pray from 7 o'clock in the morning. We're praying for unity, bringing the streams and the races together, because Acts 2-1 precedes Acts 2-2. They were all together in one place in one accord, and then suddenly out of heaven. And then that afternoon, we're going to pray for signs and wonders with the Bethel movement. Many of the healing revivalists are gathering. We're believing for incurable diseases to be healed and proclamation of the gospel that night. I'm making that shift with the call right will there, now. Will there be prayers going forth for our elections or things? We're not going to make that the main point. Right. We will pray for our nation. We'll pray for the elections, but that's not the main point. I believe the hope for America is a great spiritual awakening. All right. Well, Lou, how can people get involved? In this go event? to the call. I mean, go to <laughs> AzusaNow2016.com. Get all the information. Begin to fast and pray right now. Let's not go for an, an, an event. Let's go for a massive breakthrough across the nation. That would be incredible. It will be incredible. And I know because I've been to many of your prayer events and God uses you in a mighty way. And uh, I hope I'm going to be there. We'll see. <laughs> if you're there. It'd be awesome for you to pray. I oh. give you an invitation. There you go. All right. Everybody heard it. All right. Lou Engel is leading Azusa Now 2016, the event happening on April 9th in Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Tickets are free of charge, and you can register or learn more about this event by going to their website. Again, AzusaNow2016.com. Lou, you're an inspiration. God bless you. I love you. you. Bless you. Thank bless you, you so much. <laughs> well, coming up, time for another round of Bring It On. Grace says, I am 11 years old, and I want to know why God doesn't answer some of my prayers. We'll weigh in on that and more when we return. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Well, normally, the birth of a baby is considered a blessing. But the mother in our next story had a different way to describe her daughter, a punishment. That's because her daughter was born with a cleft lip, and the family had no way to pay to get it fixed. Every time Findile or Sylvester fed their baby, they remembered the first day they held her in their arms and saw that their baby was born with a cleft lip and palate. My first thought was that I had done something wrong and God was punishing me. She worried what Sylvester would think when he saw their baby, but his reaction wasn't what she expected. I told myself that even if she's crippled, there's a lot of children that are crippled and their parents just accepted them the way they are. So me too, I have to accept my child the way, the way she is. We named her Ntamlo, which means beloved, because she was given to us by God. Both parents did what they could to help her. Sylvester went online to find out more about her condition, while Pindila talked to God. I asked my church to come and pray for her. I believed God was waiting for us to pray because when we did, we soon found our help. Not long after that, CBN paid for Intando's surgery through Operation Smile. They knew that their prayers had been answered. When I saw Ntando after the surgery, I couldn't believe my eyes. She was perfect. I was so happy. It was tears of joy all over. Now she's okay, she grow up like any other child. 
CPN. Thank you, CPN. I am so grateful. I cannot repay you for what you did, but I pray you'll be able to continue helping other children the way you helped mine. One child, one life, one future. That's what we're dealing with. Those things cost somewhere around about $500 to get a cleft palate fixed uh, in a skillful fashion. And uh, it's a privilege to give that kind of money and also to see our dear friends at Operation Smile, the McGee's and their, their associates. We all work together uh, to get this job done. Uh, for those of you who want to help, I have something, a DVD called Heaven, um, and it shows what God has prepared for them that love Him. We've got testimonies of people who died and went to heaven. We've got a cardiac surgeon who records about a number of his patients who died, went to heaven, came back and told about it. Uh, is heaven real? It certainly is. We'll give you this as you join the 700 Club. Wendy. Well, it is time to bring it on Let's do with it. your email. Right. And we've got this from Grace. And she says, Hi, Pat. I'm 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And I have a question for you. I pray every night, but sometimes God doesn't answer my prayers. I go to church and I've been baptized. I love Jesus and I don't say bad words or anything <laughs> like that. Why doesn't God answer some of my prayers? And I love your show. <laughs> well, you're a sweetheart. You know, um, uh, you go to bed at night with your mother and father and uh, uh, you pray together or you talk together or they read stories to you and their stuff. Um, you could ask them every night for a bicycle or a pony or uh, a new dress or something and uh, they wouldn't give you a new bicycle and a pony and a dress every night. It just doesn't work that way. And the thing that's important with you and them is that you're in their presence and they're in your presence and they love you and you love them. That's what God wants. He wants you to be in his presence. He wants you to talk to him. And uh, he wants to talk to you. He wants to love you. Uh, but it's not just a gimme thing. You know, he doesn't answer my prayers. Sure he does. If he gives you himself, he's answered something far, far better than, uh, you know, uh, t toy or whatever you're asking for. Okay. All right. Karen says, I just turned away my 27-year-old son when he said he needed a place to stay, but I'm not sure I did the right thing. He and his child's mother have been living together for three and a half years. For the last six months, they get in arguments at least once every two weeks. He comes to my house for a few days, then he goes back. I've prayed about this and mostly feel at peace, but other times I get overwhelmingly guilty and sad. Did I do the right thing? Shouldn't I feel a real sense of peace doing the right thing? Uh, you might not feel peace on this one. Uh, you're doing the right thing, but it hurts you because you love your son and uh, you want to do everything you can to make him happy. Uh, and he is one screwed up guy. I don't know what's going on, but I, I can't imagine what you just told me. It's just uh, beyond belief. That young man needs to get his act together. He needs counseling. He needs help. And the girl he's living with, they need to straighten that relationship out. So, you know, yeah. it's your grandchild's mother. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but uh, uh, you, you're just an enabler. Whatever, whatever is wrong with them, by opening your home and making it easy, you're enabling. So don't feel guilty about doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing, but, but you do it in love. All Amen. Right. Good answer. All right. Margaret says, my mother, who still lives alone, needs memory care. So I connect by phone and in person several times a day. She no longer takes care of household things. My husband is weak from past illness and depressed some of the time. I feel I'm being pulled in two directions. Where is my main loyalty, according to the word? Both want my attention, and I'm wearing out. Well, the Bible says, uh, um, for this cause, a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the twain shall become one flesh. Uh, your prime allegiance is to your spouse. And uh, uh, your mother has gotten to an advanced stage of uh, uh, dementia or whatever it is that's going on. She's she's. She's losing her facilities, which happens in advanced age to people. Uh, I don't know if that's Alzheimer's or just senile dementia, whatever name it is. Uh, but uh, what she needs is professional care, and she needs to be institutionalized because she can't take care of herself. 
there are places that are set up to look after them 24 hours a day. And uh, you'd be doing her a great favor if you were able to afford such a place so that she could be cared for professionally. Uh, and then, you know, you, you do the right thing. I, I don't know what else to say, but that's what I'd recommend. All right. That's a good answer because I think a lot of marriages get strained because oh, yeah. one of the partners is paying more attention to the, their mother or father than their, their mates. Well, they're being drained financially, emotionally, and spiritually. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 55. Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Well, tomorrow the 700 Club gets trumped. <laughs> We're going to show you the highlights from Donald Trump's visit to Regent University on Thursday. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.